Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor, and Jim, 300 months ago, Spawn number one came out. Can you believe it? <laughs> I wasn't even driving then. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a boy reading X-Men comics, and it was like issue 268, it felt like a million years ago X-Men 1 came out. You know what I'm saying, man? So for the fact that it's like, I was, you know, 5th, 6th grade... Still running at double digits of age when Spawn number one came out. It's weird having 27-year-old memories, Jimmy. It sure is. More than <laughs> half my life now. <laughs> I figured, though, man, what better time celebrating the 300th issue of Spawn magazine that we take a look at the Spawn Vault edition, man. First seven issues of Spawn's original artwork. Famously, Todd McFarlane didn't sell any Spawn pages, man. So that's why it's called the Vault edition. He just cracked open... His, uh, his Uncle Scrooge money bin <laughs> and, and busted out a couple stacks of Spawn pages to put into a nice hardcover edition. How much did you read? Like, tell me you didn't read every single one of these pages a, a million times. It is burnt into my head deeply. You know, we talk about like the wizards being unlocking some kind of brain pathways going through this book because. I've been fortunate to, to come over here and go through this several times. It just is amazing, like, how much these are committed to memory. This was the book, man. You know, like, when Spawn came out, there was no book I wanted more than Spawn. Great end pages to start it off. That's it. Oh, how about that? Signed edition. So, a couple things on this book. One, it's it's out of print now. I can't find a copy for under $400. Most are over 500 So, Todd, please reprint this. This is a first printing Let's do another printing for all the poor saps like me. But he also signed several of them, uh, kind of at random. I, I can't remember what the ratio was, but you got to sign one. So that's pretty cool. Super cool, man. And I found it for super cheap on eBay because the box was a little janked up, man. But the book is totally cool, dude. This is 2017 when this was released. I'm pretty happy with the design overall. That's something that we've talked about off camera in regards to some of these artist editions, and I think this looks pretty good. Yeah, I'm into it. The only complaint I have, that's really fun, is uh, I wish there was like a picture of tools. You know, see, see like I, I look at this and I think like, so a little bit of this is brushed, right? Like this heavier line, is that a brush? Yeah, it looks I like I know it. that, you know, like he's famous for the Hunt 102 was like his nib of choice at the time, but it'd be cool to see that. Some yeah, kind of great. layout of those things. Look at that, man. Uh, no chain there. And the little skull treatment is a bit different. I, I actually always, never noticed that. I always love the, uh, cor the, the image box because they don't do that very often. So it's neat whenever a character's in there. So one of the punk rock things that we notice right away is Spawn 1 drawn on Marvel paper. <laughs> That's a pretty cool fuck you. wonder if he had to get permission to reprint that. Dude, that's actually a good question because I was going to, um, on my Rob Liefeld Hip Hop Family Tree 300 thing where I was drawing in Rob Liefeld style, I had some blue line pages and I wanted it to be uh, image paper, but Gary at Fanta wasn't down with that. He, he just, he saw that it could be trouble. Noteworthy thing uh, in terms of the Orzakowski lettering here, and I'll find some good examples. Uh, this is a good example. So, like, if you look, if you put your nose to the page and you take a look at the Orzakowski lettering, you will find that it is uh, it is on vellum. Mm. It's lettered on vellum. That's what these registration marks are here. So, this is a piece of acetate that has the lettering pasted onto it. So, the, there will be registration dots on the original artboard. There will be registration dots on the plastic so that the lettering goes exactly where presumably Todd McFarlane wanted it to be. Now here's the thing, when you're lettering on vellum, there's so much more to your job, so much more sort of back-end work that's not fun because of things like this where uh, there's probably line art underneath this. So on the back of each of these balloons, you have to paint that white. I wondered about that whenever you said it was on vellum. I was looking at like how lively these letter forms are. I think of like Todd Klein does a variety of, of different fonts and stuff. And, and now I realize that's digital, but it's still based on fonts that he was creating. And he would do that with different characters, like in Sandman or something. Um, there's a real liveliness to this stuff. 
you know, like 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 you're not as tightly uh, gridded out uh, with bass lines and things. And the other letter I would think of is Rick Parker had kind of like these very lively lettering style. And that's somebody that worked a lot with Todd McFarlane, like on Amazing Spider-Man and Spider-Man. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because you take a look at those Spider-Man books. And I think that Todd nudged these guys into the direction of being more playful storytelling wise. Like he, he gets zero credit for like the storytelling of his comics or anything like that. But when it came to the individual tasks at hand, he wanted to stretch these guys out a little bit. And, and he required that of his people. Tom Wozniakowski lettered, Many, many X-Men comics, and he did not use any of these fonts or play around with the lettering in the way that he's doing here. Yeah, this I think a, uh, X-Men had its own lettering challenges, for just da- trying to fit, fit stuff into pages. For damn sure, but Todd is the best paid guy in comics. I don't know this for sure, but I bet you he made these guys the best paid letterers, the best paid colorists, etc. and so forth, man, when it came to the comic book page. These pages are incredible. This is a movie poster. You know, it's it's uh, it's so iconic. I remember this page, I think, from Amazing Heroes or, or somewhere. You know, like I was picking up everything I could get in terms of previews and, and trying to satiate my appetite for this. So really cool to see them in this format. It's astounding. You know, I mentioned the Hunt 102. And so like that kind of noodling, inking style is what I would associate style-wise with McFarlane of this time period compared to, say, a Scott Williams inking Jim Lee, which was very controlled. This stuff was much more organic, and I like that quality. It's a very lively uh, quality. On top of the brushes in the Hunt 102, though, he would he would use uh, micron pens and such fine liners, and that's what we're seeing here. And with the with the uh, with the passage of time, we could see how the different inks uh, kind of age over over time, and we're seeing that here. When you take a look at the art at its kind of original size, you can deconstruct McFarlane a little bit more, a little bit closer you don't have the steve olive coloring doing half the half the labor and i identify maybe like five textures that mcfarlane has okay that he, that he employs throughout the entire piece yeah. man and he'll do that uh he'll do that constantly to create like the the kind of busyness so there will be like the hatching piece there's the little noodling pieces and there's a few there's a few other bits that will see along the way that you could kind of point to as a McFarlane stroke. So graphic. So his background is in graphic design, and I've seen interviews where he talks about spotting blacks in terms of uh, design composition, you know, like trying to balance out pages and compositions. But you also see the inventiveness, right? Like page layouts are so different from page to page. You know, we're not seeing six panel grids or anything. And then this treatment of like buildings and city background is something we haven't seen so far. Interesting footer. Pretty cool to see. One other thing, uh, I guess we could point to even the, this wrist here. Um, he gets he gets a lot of a lot of disses, man, for anatomical stuff. But everything to me is interesting looking, and he has some reasonable idea of the underlying structure of the figures that he draws for the most part, and can communicate the volume of the shapes pretty well. Did he make this up? Yes, but it's rooted enough that it feels like a solid form rather than just a bunch of uh, chicken scratch lines. I was thinking, like, where does this come out in regards to Sin City? Because there are these kind of silhouettes, and they make me... And obviously, Sin City didn't invent silhouettes, but I think of Marv jumping out the window, and I think of, like, the use of silhouettes in those comics, and everybody talks about Frank Miller at this time period. I wonder, like where this all fits in time wise the second you bring that up and i see this page i'm like man i can't help but think about miller looking at that tom Warzakowski, chance to shine do some uh b- bigger lettering some display style lettering there will be a few instances in this in this book man where he's just like really going for it a little spider-man i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> This, this, uh, you'll see this like throughout the book where the, the guy had to Xerox Mm -hmm. and reduce the imagery to repeat it. For instance, later on, there'll be a spawn coming across like a storefront with a bunch of TV screens that have Savage Dragon on it. And the Savage Dragon kind of like fits and works on all of them. So it's like he, this, you could be more schizophrenic and just like probably the Xeroxes happened before the panel borders. And then, you know, he did, so it's like reduce it like by 
increments of 10%. But when, if we see the Savage Dragon one through our flip, you'll notice that it's like kind of perfect on every one. And it's like, I can't imagine Todd was sitting there with a the reduction wheel getting the percentages right. So there's, there's something more to it. Could this be the first time these characters were drawn and like everybody just kind of like used this in a repeated fashion on all their books? Because these news broadcasters would be in all the image people's books pretty much. Yeah, I assume that's the case. It's fun. You can see kind of like the blue line to make that E versus like the reproduced version over here. Yeah. I love that hand. <laughs> I love that so much. I love this page. Yeah, I'm, I'm astounded by the page, the variation in page layout. That's something I didn't pay too much attention to as a kid, if at all it was just internalized. But whenever you see these pages in this format, it's clear, like... And, and also, he would talk about writing where he would draw several pages and then kind of lay them out and build his story from those pages. And that's that makes sense when you think of these pages as, like, some kind of graphic unit uh, that stands on their own, at least some of the pages. All these images are so memorable. Like, he, he created a lot of iconographic imagery in, in, in comic book form. This is pretty fun. I often think of Dave Sim as doing a lot of variation and lettering, like, within a word balloon, within a block of text. And so you see a good bit of that here, some different styles, bolds, italics, outlines, and then, of course, the violator. That's a pretty great face. That's a classic McFarlane face. Like, we'll see that angle a lot in, like, Billy Kincaid poses and junk. That's, that's a pretty fun cartoon, too. We talk a lot about cartooning as being like an element, you know, the fun, the, the something cartoony as being a, a piece of these guys, and it feels like that's a really good example of McFarlane cartooniness. Yeah, that character especially. <laughs> Meatball head. <laughs> like, you could tell he had some fun with that, man. This is the iconic. There are a lot of McFarlane pages uh, in, in Spider-Man and other works where it's like the profile and then the panels beside the profile. Yeah, I might steal that soon, actually. That's a popular one. If I were going to try to mimic McFarlane, that would be a composition I would reference. Super simple, but totally reads as a city. <laughs> there he is. I was always underwhelmed by Violator's design. Yeah, I was always uh, overwhelmed by the boils and the <laughs> and the, the 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 flotsam and jetsam all over his texture. Man, like I, even looking at it right now. Uh, I could get lost in it. It's funny seeing this page in black and white because there's so much nonsense with like the blood splatter and everything. It just kind of all washes together in black and white. Nearly trencher. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's spawn with a nose, man. He figured that out later. Gotta and an get, underbite. Got to get rid of that. More of your hand pose. For sure. And he's uh, leaving a little bit of like this is like a magical page you know a lot of garbage happening a lot of energy happening so this would be a steve olive page and he would like lighten up the lines for for that kind of stuff this is an interesting texture because we don't see him use this texture very often and it reminds me a little bit of like kirby dots or something trying to have like that blasting kind of energy right not not quite the kirby dot style but that's not one i see much with uh, his work fan of these panel borders I've been using similar ones lately. I wonder how he made those. Because that would be a pain to like draw individual lines. He must have had like... Man, it doesn't look like dry brush. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of extra work. A lot of hearts in Violator's world. This is interesting because we've seen this and now we've seen... Yeah, we're starting to see some, some, some tropes. Repeating certain motifs. When he was doing... Infinity Incorporated, he did a uh, a panel composition where it was cross bones because there's a guy called Mr. Bones. Makes me think of that. Look, this is more Marvel paper, but it's a different Marvel letterhead. Interesting. Good eye, man. More Tom, Tom O. That's really nice. I like that a lot. Yeah. Everybody should add Todd Klein uh, or, or follow him on uh, uh, Facebook because he's probably maxed out on, on followers because he keeps uh, albums on his page of just like interesting comic book lettering. Yeah, I I want to say it was Todd Klein had posted, like, I guess there was a guy in the Marvel bullpen that did a lot of the cover lettering, and he posted a bunch of artwork, or a bunch of lettering from, from this one artist, and I can't remember the guy's name, but it was amazing to see. It was, like, all the blurbs and, and the big display stuff. Spawn still has that nose. This looks like a, just a very old man Yeah. in there. 
he figured that out. Like sometimes, especially if you're working at this size and you're probably working with speed because he, he wasn't like, he was the most on time, we'll say. Uh, you don't see the forest for the trees, man. So you got to get these pages out, especially with the level of noodling and stuff that he would do. I'm glad you rethought that. When I would try to figure out this kind of stuff, like if, if you did, I could kind of make it work at a small size, you know, lots of folds in the cape and everything. But whenever you would get like super zoomed in, it'd be like, what the hell do you draw on the cape? Right. Because like from here, it's just, it's just a shape. But like whenever you get in there, you have to have that kind of noodling for it to look consistent. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the monthly thing. Going through this, that was something that stood out to me is a lot of these pages, it'll be two or three figures on a page, maybe four figures on a page. Clearly, uh, that's helpful if you're trying to make that monthly deadline. It's almost like there's a, you can imagine a, a clock running on these pages. Like, okay, I've got eight hours or something to do on this page. Yeah, and if he had a little more time, maybe he would have put some more uh, garbage like in there. And yet another font here from uh, Orzakowski to indicate... Who's this guy, Mel... Mel, Mel Boja. Yes. <laughs> Never pronounce any names I see in comics. The only reason I know is because I watched the cartoon recently. Oh, yeah, that's right, man. He would draw a violator clown with, like, a million little teeth. All the gum. So gross. <laughs> <laughs> that's like uh, Andre the Giant's mouth. It is. It really is. Poor Andre. Yeah, he, he, he abandoned the white boy spawn pretty early. But go back real quick. Like, he's... He's he always does this. This is not Xeroxed and pasted up. This would not be fun to draw a million times. Very Chris Ware esque. <laughs> it's he's he's got it. Like he's got like an ornate kind of thing, man. I give him props for that. Should we talk about that in any way, shape, or form? Go ahead. <laughs> what do you think of that dog? Ed? Yeah, no, like, <laughs> and look at how it looks in silhouette as like a rat or something yeah, like, it's like a rat coyote. But the fact that it's like. A, you know, they're going out to, to to a gala, and she has a mangy-ass dirty dog right there. <laughs> like, he established this spawn as a, um, as a Caucasian guy, and he has notes right there. Like, Steve, this Steve Olive, uh, this family is black. And we'll see. Uh, we may have even passed a bunch, but there are uh, definitely notes to the colorist. There's that mangy. I mean, what animal is it? That's a sci-fi animal. Yeah. Yeah, you see one here. She's wearing nylons. So that's interesting to see the notes, uh, color notes. Yeah, he's he's paying for that color out of his dime, so he wants what he wants, man. This is kind of an interesting drawing, where you're hitting like a side a side lighting, like a color like a color hold. I always hated when he did that. There will be several versions of that because it just looks so unfinished, and you know he's leaving that up for the colorist to do their thing. And you know, once again, there's a there's a note there, but it always feels like all of this should be black. That's what I was just going to say. That is like a variation of what would be a shadow. Yeah. It's just you're doing it with color instead of solid black. Yeah, it never works to me uh, when McFarland does it. I think they steal that from Mignola, uh, old Mignola, and it's, it works with Mignola, but Todd um, could never pull it off, and, and there will be more examples here, but... It was it was my least favorite thing about uh, Todd's art. I'd say that's not as successful. <laughs> <laughs> that happens sometimes, man. Yeah, listen, you got to shoot your shots, man. <laughs> Violator wearing an image shirt. And once again, see, like I would want to color that in. Yeah. Like just sitting here, I kind of like want to hit that with a micron and silhouette that in. Unfinished sketch backside of page four, issue two. That's so interesting. He's going Busama. I bet you was on the phone with Rob just shooting a shit, man, and like had to had to had to get the pen moving. Look at what a weird design of a character that is, too. Totally. Almost like a rat with the spawn eyes. Or something. I guess those teeth maybe aren't quite a rat. It's very bizarre. I like seeing the shape. Also, um, you say Busama, but also like a Bill Sienkiewicz around the uh, Dune era. Some of that sketch stuff. Yeah, I just say Busema because uh, Busema, minimal penciling. Because Busema is famous for his best drawings being on the, on the uh, back side of his pages. It's funny when you don't see a lot of black in the pages. That's some uh, interesting texture we haven't seen a lot of from from him yet. And a little bit of a panel border variation here, so it's just straight lines, not totally parallel, just rolled out. I do like that he's he's kind of playing with everything. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about panel borders that way makes sense with the way the pages are laid out, but you don't see a lot of cartoonists doing that. Man, that's such a great... Nice hole in the chest. I remember this stuff vividly. I know. Right? 
You have 27 year old memories, Jimbo. So Tom Warzakowski really helping to build the page. This is kind of in line with what you would see with some of the X-Men stuff where it was like trying to balance out your typography all over. Yeah. But then also a relatively simple drawing. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, in the beginning of a comic, I don't know that you're thinking deadlines and trying to make up time, although maybe it's, it's last issue was late or something. So it's like, that to me looks like a faster page. Yeah. Uh, Not necessarily a, a compromise in equality, <laughs> but you know, I mean, like this happens all over by different artists. And he wanted, to, he wanted to, he knew he th that this could page be was it too. He up, bought man. himself another half day or something by by uh, making the last page less fast, which also happens. But man, this is the one to ribs and stuff broken, so he could get to the heart. Yeah, he modified the previous drawing uh -huh. that we saw in the earlier issue. Put a couple ribs in that gimmick. <laughs> he this, was always good at this stuff. Yeah, that stuff's surprisingly hard, at least for me. It's very hard for me, too. Like, things that don't have a hard edge are really tough. Smoke, water, fire, even flames, to me, uh, are not easy. But he was always great at it, and, like, his liquids are always really good. Man, probably the best liquid he ever did, man, was that final splash page of uh, Batman, uh, of Spawn Batman, when he has that... Uh, boomerang in his face like i stared at that jizz all over that boomerang so much i thought it was perfect <laughs> for real i think it's brush yeah it probably is i think he uses a little bit of brush for sure nice detail attention to detail on your word balloon but i love this page composition where like they're facing each other across the page and he's starting to photostat that shape like he drew it probably five times and was like, F that from now on. Look, this is some of that, um, what would be a silhouette normally. But I, I can see why it's not that way here. You know, like if you're, if you're showing this focal point of the hole in the darkness and blood and all that stuff, what are you going to do? It's like black on black if you make that a silhouette. But yeah, like, like I think I would have inverted it. But, and, then, and then the black would kind of balance that black too, I think. Yeah, just every time he does it, I don't think, like, I think that's fine. Yeah. That works. He does this a lot with the hands. Mm -hmm. I thought for a minute it was three fingers, but <laughs> there's a finger tucked back in there. There was a shot earlier of, of uh, Violator in clown form, and he was uh, three fingers, so I've been trying to pay attention to see if that's consistent with the character or if that was just one page. Here we go. Yeah, that's sick. That's super sick, man. So badass. <laughs> Good energy. There's going to be another Vault Edition that's coming out uh, next month. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put my pre-order in as soon as we get off this this thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to have that. If we were to uh, fast forward, uh, there's a Tom Wurzikowski page. Yeah, this is another one of those pages. You're, you're making up some time. But it looks really good, and it looks good within the context of the comic book for sure, like because it's variation, it's something different. And McFarlane talks about that a lot in interviews. Is like it doesn't have to be perfect; it needs to be exciting, it needs to hold the attention of the reader. And so this kind of stuff works pretty well. That enough is really nice. Yeah, that's a portfolio piece. Tom Wozniakowski put that in his portfolio. <laughs> this caught my eye first time through. Is it's a very cartoon like this is comic book shorthand for a city, right? And, and you can see all the way to like undergrounds guys and, and comic strips doing this kind of representation yeah. for a city backdrop. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Good scale. Yes. Good scale because Violator's already gigantic compared to him, but then, you know, selling Malbosia up against them. And they always strategically find a way to put a little, little hidey hole man on the, <laughs> on the cod piece. <laughs> they always figure that out. Do you do vertical panels like that? Not really. It's very dicey, either. and it's it's hard to compose in that. But I'll tell you this: this as an example, this is a this is a good uh, McFarlane yeah. horizontal composition one because there are many bad ones in, in Spider Man. Because what would happen is he would have this thing, and he would try to get it would be a big image, but he would try to get all of Mary Jane's face in it, right? And have these eyeballs that are millimeters Squished apart from together. one another. <laughs> Pretty bad. <laughs> That's great. I like that. Yeah, so Jim, I'm really like looking at this uh, kind of closely for like the panel compositions for the for the thing that I'm working on these days, man. Because of the exciting nature of uh, of the, the the layout, um, it it betrays storytelling sometimes. So I'm very mindful of that. But I think you can do good storytelling and uh, still have a nice variation of, of panels and stuff. This is what I was talking about. Right. With uh, like he did not use a reduction wheel to like make all these different Xeroxes for Dragon's Head, but 
they, they all work. Uh, but you will notice that sometimes he has to draw a millimeter or two uh, outward for some of these photo stats that he pasted up in there. That's Miller-ish. Even, even that. Mm-hmm. Ooh, oh, we're going to get to a splash issue. page, boy. This is where I think he uh, may have crossed the line in the eyes of some retailers. <laughs> Billy Kincaid, ice cream truck killer. Yes, sir. Got that little soul patch. A lot, of, a lot of fat guys as bad guys. Also a lot of um, predatory, like, child molester stuff. Like, that was in uh, the Spider-Man uh, with Wolverine and Wendigo. That's true. Cerebus uh, cameo. A little ahead of its time. Oh, they go back. That might be a Felix. It is a Felix, yeah. A couple Felixes. Uh, one, one of, uh, I guess, the Easter eggs that he hides. A little shout out to Miller and Moore. Here we go. See... His thing with Spawn is, like, Batman always lets Joker go. Like, my guy kills guys. My guy's going to kill guys. And he kind of, like, does what everybody else doesn't. And you never have a guy mangling children and gluing their fingers to a piece of paper. (laughs) No, no, you don't. (laughs) So he decided to... Nature abhors a vacuum, James. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Certainly there was demand for this. <laughs> wow, so look at even the, the lettering. It's so fun. <laughs> so Todd has to fill that niche. So dark. You um, know what, by the way? That, that's also in uh, the first villain in Sin City. was Because uh, Billy Kincaid is like a senator's kid. That's, mm. the, that's the whole spiel, right? And that's Kevin from Sin City. Like O'Rourke's kid. Yeah. So I think that that might be a little inspiration. Interesting. It, it seems like it would just be the checklist of, like, what's the worst crime you can commit, you know, if you're trying to make up a terrible character. Right. Um, I, w- I want to point out this drawing of the reflection, because that feels like line work that we haven't seen him use before. It's really nice line work, like, from a drawing standpoint. Not one that we see a lot, you know, like, usually you have that kind of more feathered type line right? Um, in comics, but this stuff's a little more jagged to try to, you know, approximate or communicate liquid and water and a puddle and reflection. Yeah. Uh, the reason I'm just to be clear about the Sin City villain thing, like you remember Kevin, Kevin O'Rourke is like, he's, he's like a dirty secret, like to, uh, yeah, to that family. And, and his father is like a Senator and like Jason Wynn is tied up. So, so like he's being kept quiet now. Oh, I got a piece of piece of Intel from Chris, Chris Burnham okay. told me this. Now when we, we're doing wizard episodes and we saw the solicitation for issue five. I made note that it was far different than uh, what the issue actually came to be. And when that issue, when that episode of ours went live, Chris Burnham, the artist on officer down hit me up and says, dude, I know why it's different, man. I know why the story changed and the story changed because at this point, Todd McFarlane signed Alan Moore up to do Spawn number eight. And if you remember, the next appearance you see of Billy Kincaid is in Spawn number eight. He's one of the guys in hell. So this issue was created to to uh, have a guy that they could send to hell. And that was different than the solicitation. So this wow. is what McFarlane came up with kind of in a pinch because he got Alan Moore on the on the on the docket, and Alan Moore had this idea about, like, exploring Hal and Melbosia and stuff. That's so interesting. So that's how we get there. Man, this is a... That's what I was just thinking, like, we've seen some pages that are much more minimal, and it... This looks like it takes a while. Yeah. (laughs) That many marks? Good lord. Yeah. Oh, the nose is still there. Yeah, we gotta get rid of that soon. This is pretty classic. Yeah, I, I would say ins- that's a Mignola inspired piece, man. I've seen, I seen like a Batman. It reminds me of down. Batman Year Two. There's an image of uh, kind of to this scale, cape fluttering everywhere. Also a McFarlane. Uh, yeah. You know, not ripping off himself or whatever. Nine panel grids. You don't see it. We haven't seen too many of these. He's hitting a rhythm, man, because we have to get to a splash page soon. Gotcha. Now, this splash page is not the splash page that no. I'm thinking, but we'll get there. Man, look at the distortion in the fingers. <laughs> yeah, totally. Those fingers look familiar. There it is, man. 
classic image. Dare I say iconic? <laughs> he draws a good ice cream scooper. That, that's one of the <laughs> things that I noticed. Like, oh. Plus the fact that, like, just imagine the violence of that, because the other end of that is very blunt. Right. And you could jab this blunt thing in a dude's chest. <laughs> it's brutal, man. <laughs> and then you hear about, like, in tornadoes and stuff, toothpicks getting, like, pushed right. through house, like, the slats and walls and houses and stuff. This background's very Sin City. It is. It is. The chains in perspective there. <laughs> <laughs> there should be like blue line. Where's the vanishing point? <laughs> oh man. Overkill. Nice. Wow. Yeah, we're getting into the gun. Look at era. this. Man, I would look at this thing to try to figure out like how do you draw a good explosion? And it's like I can't take anything away from this. <laughs> <laughs> what I take away from this, and it happens from our wizard episodes and, and reinvestigating some of the books we looked at, there's an explosion in, uh, I believe it's Wildcats 1, that has a lot of these textures. So I think that McFarlane may have taken a peek, man. I don't know when this came out in conjunction with that. But there's a lot of stuff like that that I look up. Two very similar explosions, and I specifically made note of like this kind of thing. But I bet you... You could look in frontline combat and see some. And, and we should say this is the character that he co creates with Rob Liefeld on the Stan Lee video. It is. Yeah. <laughs> they added a T so Stan Lee wouldn't sue them. Yes. Amazing. I think they even did this uh this gimmick logo on that video. They, they did, man. The bullseye. This is awesome because it's like spawn with guns. It is, and we will see a couple good images of spawn with guns. <laughs> I wonder if they had to go in here and take out the name Tony Twist. Yeah, now I want to look for that. <laughs> Man, I feel like we keep banging that Sin City drum, but it's hard not to whenever you see these kinds of things. I agree. Beautiful lettering. Simple, but perfect. Yeah, you feel it. Like, you could, you know what that sounds like. And every now and then, like, we've done lettering, you know, where you're trying to do something expressive... You just hit it right sometimes, and you can almost feel it, and that, that feels perfect. This might be the most panels on a page. This would be a stroke of his from uh, the, what was that, a the Invasion book mm -hmm. for DC? He would do that where he would have a million characters on a page. Yeah, the takeaway is the Sin City flavor in this. Yeah, thing. I don't remember that too much. Yeah, the color kind of like threw threw us off the scent trail a little bit. Ooh, that's hard as hell. Yeah, that's badass. This is great. It does feel like he's like figured something out where like he's upping. Maybe he's on a phone a bunch. I think he used to talk on a phone in ink. But it feels like the amount of like grays and textures, like some of it's hard to even decipher. That's real fun. Yeah. That's interesting. Like you're going for this fight scene and you're going for the chaos and all of the, the, the art really reflects that. There it is, man. <laughs> <laughs> As a boy at Century 3 Mall, I remember seeing this image uh, airbrushed on shirts. For sixty dollars, man. The guy who had the little pagoda, man. He would he would hook you up with one, for the small sum of sixty dollars. How, how many how many people picked up this issue and then were just copying this drawing, man? Totally. Just trying to trying to recreate some of that magic. Totally. And that's not all. You know, you like we have plenty of it. There's a lot. Yeah, it's just splash page <laughs> after splash page of Spawn with guns. No gun looks the same twice. That's hilarious. Yeah, his little pecker would cops or whatever they should all be green like the little <laughs> toys right <laughs> wonder when we see that uh power meter go away i think that's way it's that's after my time is it yeah for sure i i read up until about right after image x month that's a pretty cool not easy to do no looks good not easy to do man that looks like that could be a music cover or something and he will go on and do corn covers and out and music videos. Might even have a damn Grammy award. That guy. And Farland has guys. That kid's going some going places. This was one I loved. The same thing you said about whenever you see like a, a close up of, of Spawn and you have the cape and like you have to keep everything consistent. He's really good. Like when you draw just just faces, big. 
uh, that becomes an issue. And, yeah. he, and he figures that out. If your style is, is this kind of noodling detail, it is hard to figure that out. Like so certain stuff just should be clean and smooth. Skin possibly one of them, maybe an old man, not so much. But yeah, he's, he's pretty good at figuring out how to apply that style to almost everything. Bullet holes are always great. Yeah, he calls them bullet wounds <laughs> on that on that overkill. That's video. such a ridiculous panel. Like he's blown away this whole office. Yeah, yeah, it's great, great man. It's still comics, you know. Never that's tried to awesome. sell that idea. Arm ripped off and the shit hanging from it. Yeah, and that's also awesome. They drop a little coffee on it on his page. Oh, there it is, man. Gets that gimmick through the eye. The thing he couldn't do in X Force, Juggernaut Spider Man. He finally gets to use it here. We should phone him up and tell him that's a tangent. <laughs> you think that that would sell one less copy? He can break some rules. It's just like, there's a money shot on almost every page. Yeah, you wonder like who figures that part out. Because that's a real thing. I think that's uh, that's something that McFarlane really brought to the table. You would hear about like other guys like Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld... The image guys, basically. Yeah. They would be criticized for designing pages that were like that. Sometimes they were called pinup pages, but in interviews they talk about, you know, you'd have that as a way to sell that artwork. But it does feel like he figured this out. I, I got away from the image stuff at some point, as I think a lot of people do. Yeah. And it was like, I don't want to do anything like that. You know, like I rejected it at one point. And now I've been trying to fold back in yeah. those money shots. Like have something exciting on those pages or on those spreads. It's exactly where I'm at right now. Like I've I've got my 10,000 hours in using the, the Kirby Ditko panel composition. And I would actually also equate it with my influence from um, Klaus and the Hernandez brothers and, and the... the you know, generation one fanographics guys using like just the grid. The grid is the thing. But the kind of story I'm working on now, that just ain't the case. Yeah. Three. Nice end page payoff. So that's from the same page, but you have that setup of the shooting. See, I'm going to need Todd probably to send me one of these so that we could photograph this next to each other. Todd, hit the boy up. <laughs> he does a lot of good work for you. Eric Stevenson. <laughs> Let's go. I do love it, though, man. I, I want these artist editions to use every piece of the of the book. And I've seen some that just have nothing going on on their end pages. And I, it makes me so angry. So it's great to see it. And it's cool to see that this is two pages. You know, like this is a two-page spread, this image. Um, so you get to see the seam in the pages. So Todd is celebrating issue 300 of Spawn 300 months ago, give or take. Issue 1 came out. 27 years ago, and and here at the Kayfabe Compound, we, ha we have to send sal salutations to the Todd father. He was a huge influence growing up. Uh, he inspired me to even begin a comics career when I was younger. He was the first name that I've kind of like really known, sought out, and recognized. I'm saying, I'm saying I bought those Incredible Hulks when I was a little boy off the damn stands, and I saw that name Todd McFarlane, and I followed that name Todd McFarlane internalize these comics for, for, for better or worse <laughs> uh, when it comes to just like the craft of comic book storytelling for better or worse internalize these pages like crazy and uh, it was a, it was a blast going through this artist edition Jimmy you know what I thought of when we were reviewing this Spawn like one to whatever sold the most comics the year that it was published yeah you know as a, as a run like that year and I think it only published nine or ten issues compared to say X-Men or something of the same time period it was the biggest selling comic of 1993. It's these issues, you know, like this is this is part of that, uh, you know, comprises that time period. So pretty neat to see them, you know, 25 years later and kind of get a chance to look at them from this different angle because the computer coloring certainly makes a difference. The paper it's printed on makes a difference. Seeing it in this format's incredible. And closing on an image like this is cool to actually see it bigger than the original art. And you can really get into, into those details. So it's been fun flipping through this stuff for sure, Ed. You know, as you say, huge influence, not just on you, not just on me, but, you know, like a generation of aspiring cartoonists, I think he had this impact on. So pretty cool that this object exists. Shouts to Uncle Todd, man, for hitting issue 300. Here's to another 300. Dude, we better go put our pre-orders in for Volume 2 of the Spawn Vault Edition right away. Kayfabers, 
like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that bell so we can notify you whenever we have new videos available. You can find Cartoonist Cafe merch at our spread shop. There's a link below the video to that. I think we should also get back to making some comics, Jimmy, but give these guys their marching orders before we get out of here. Read more comics.